Hello. So continuing on with the theme of narcissism, a friend of mine I spoke to just a few days ago said that she uh, she felt like she'd had a very narcissistic mother. So I thought that's interesting. I think quite a few of us have experienced that, and it does create a unique set of circumstances. So um, I googled narcissistic mother, and I came up with this article that you can see below. Um, and the person who wrote that article is talking about splitting, and how what one of the strategies of a narcissist is to split their kids um, and to actually have a black sheep and a golden child. This will resonate with many of you. I ran a, uh, a, an NLP meetup group last night uh, that I run here in Kuala Lumpur and uh, everybody, we weren't supposed to be talking about narcissism, we were supposed to talk about meditation and hypnosis and we ended up talking about narcissism the entire time. Everybody around that table had experienced narcissistic abuse or abuse at the hands of people with narcissistic personality disorder either in families or in personal relationships and everybody there said that they felt like they'd experienced what it was like to be the black sheep. So the golden child is the child that is selected for special care, special treatment um, and the black, uh, they'll always be given the best of everything and everything that they do, every naughty deed they do will be covered up and, and reframed uh, to be something positive. Um, and every good deed that they do will be put on high and, and brought to attention. The black sheep, um, we have an expression up in Liverpool, I can't do wrong for I can't do right for doing wrong, uh, which is when you're put into a double bind in a relationship where nothing you do is ever good enough and nothing you ever do is right, you are simply wrong. Um, and because that becomes your a static identity, no action of yours can ever be regarded as anything else but the, the actions of a cat and uh, uh, it's, you know some dark intent. We've, I brought this up in another video uh, whereby for a black sheep in the family, even a charitable deed, even a deed of pure positive intent and compassion will be reframed as uh, something mean, something nasty. One of the other things that we talked about last night, uh, one of the girls that came to the meetup group said that her grandmother had a tendency to um, speak ill of everybody. So even if you as the black sheep in the family then try and acquire allies and friends um, who would help you to maybe redress your view of reality and come out of that prison, um, those friends will be attacked. You know, why do you hang around with them? They're idiots, they're no good, they, they're, they're a waste of time, they're a waste of space. Um, and this reminded me of the uh, patterns of behavior that were represented so well in the series The Sopranos. Tony Soprano's mother was a, a, a classic narcissist and they actually got into the psychiatry of, of, of toxic narcissism in the Soprano series and it's, it's a very good study of it. It was actually a portrayal apparently of David Chase's mother. David Chase is the guy who wrote The Sopranos and he wanted to put his own mother as a character in the show to show how narcissists operate and the effect they have on their kids. So apart from splitting um, and making one child the golden child and the other child the black sheep uh, to some extent, another issue that came up uh, last night that we all need to be careful of is if you've been the victim of a narcissist, you're likely to have acquired some narcissism yourself. So then we got into the issue of, well, is narcissism ever healthy? And uh, all the psychology research, well, not all, but some of the psychology research out there said that it is. Uh, people who have narcissistic tendencies will make more money. Uh, will do better in life, will take better care of themselves. And if you think about it, this makes sense. And I would say, I don't know if this is an official psycho psychological term, but there, there probably is something that we could describe as a benign narcissism. So if you imagine there's a person who is completely in love with themselves, completely in love with their own idea of themselves, imagine somebody who's very eccentric and theatrical and, and uh, you know, somebody who's out for a good time, and, and, and within that, it's like a, like a sort of a, a party goer type of personality. Because I've known a few people like this and they, they become club organizers and, and uh, club managers and event organizers. But their narcissism is benign because they don't need to abuse anybody in, need to, in order to make themselves feel good. And the uh, narcissism is also benign because they are capable of compassion. So I think probably what is likely to occur is that we all hit somewhere on the scale for narcissism as in uh, using the word narcissistic as an adjective, but that does not necessarily mean you are a narcissist, a noun. If you're a narcissist, it implies uh, toxicity, it implies a need to abuse, it implies a need for sadism. I need to be cruel to you in order to make myself feel good. 
One of the terms that came up last night that some of the people there hadn't heard of is narcissistic sources and narcissistic supply. If you are uh, an empath, an empathic person, and you find yourself constantly being drawn to narcissists who then use you like a vampire sucks uh, from, from its victim, what's happening is the, the, the narcissist is using you as a narcissistic source. So anybody or anything or any situation that is a mirror, a, a funhouse mirror, in which they can look at the illusory image they have of themselves and see something beautiful and pretty, as, as long as you keep the illusion alive. Uh, if you challenge the illusion, you will either be derided, uh, outcast, or beaten, you know, so either psychologically or physically. Uh, anybody who challenges the precious, precious illusion will be attacked with a level of aggression and vociferousness um, and viciousness that, that will be shocking. And I have seen this play out. Um, another tactic that was mentioned last night is that narcissists, if you're having a conversation amongst a group of five or six friends, will try as much as possible to lead the topic of conversation back to something that they understand and that they know so that they can dominate the conversation and so they can seem to be the, the center of attention. And then somebody said, wow, narcissists, that means they're really intelligent if they know how to do all this stuff. And I said, no, not necessarily. Some narcissists are thick. And I know a couple of narcissists who, they do use the tactic of trying to change the topic of conversation constantly back to something they know. But where that tactic fails, they will just talk about stuff they have no idea about. And they'll make outrageous assertions about the topic, but in a very stroppy, very aggressive way. So that if you challenge them, it actually is going to create a scene and is going to get this very emotional uh, kickback from them. Um, a final, no, there's two final things. There's always a final, final thing with me, isn't there? There's, a, there's two final tactics that I want to draw your attention to because one of the things that came up last night is the sense of relief that everybody felt that like, my God, everybody's experienced this. I thought it was just me. Uh, I reminded them, if anybody's ever made you feel like crap just by talking to them, or if anybody's ever made you doubt your sanity and feel like you're going crazy, you'll probably have been the victim of some uh, insidious, nasty, narcissistic strategies. One of those narcissistic strategies that, that I'll, I'll leave you with is um, reframing. Reframing is something that comes from NLP, uh, but it's something that humans have done since they learned how to say ugh and oi and you know make these primal sounds of, of communication. Reframing is um, you change the meaning of a communication by, change, by subtly changing the context of the communication. So here we go, let me give you a worked example. Don't mock this, I've been working on this little sketch for days, right? So let's say I have a pen and I'm gonna gift this to my friend. I know that my friend needs a pen. So my friend comes and he says, hello friend. And I say, hello friend, I have a gift for you. Oh, do you? That's nice of you. Here's this pen. Thank you very much, he says. And then he walks off with it and he feels good because he's got a good friend and he's got a pen and I feel good because I was allowed to do an act of kindness and he said, tells me that I'm a good person and everybody's happy. Here's the same scene played out with a narcissist. I have a pen and I want to give it to the narcissist. I've actually bought this for him. But before I've even had the chance to offer, to offer it to him, he comes over to me and he says, all right, dickhead, because when he says hello to me, he immediately starts with an insult. All right, bellend, all right, you fucking tit. What's that? It's a pen. Before I've even had a chance to give it to him, he says to me, give me that fucking pen. Give me, give me that, you're, you're a fucking idiot. Give me that pen, give me that pen. Let me check it for you. The reframe here is the narcissist has to make you feel like you're doing them a favor even when uh, they're, they're taking something from you that they need. So uh, they have to, sorry, they, I ruined it now. They have to make themselves feel like they're doing you a favor even though you're doing them a favor. So you start with it, here's how to be a narcissist. All right, dickhead, something insulting. So start the frame of the conversation with an insult. All right, you dickhead, what are you doing? Fuck all, I bet, you never do anything. Oh, you've got a pen, give me that fucking pen. Let me test it for you. This pen is shit. I'm gonna take it off you because you don't need this pen. Why do you always choose such shit pens? Why are you such an idiot? So they then walk away. They then feel all good and full because they've just taken from you. They're now full of narcissistic supply. They've just used you as a narcissistic source. 
you feel, what, completely insulted, completely exploited, raped of your time, raped of your good intentions, all of that was just snatched away from you, and the whole frame, to make it even worse of the, of, of the interaction, because it's been reframed, is, I just fucking helped you. I just did you a favour. That would be like, it's very much like we talked about political prisoners last night, and I think it's never been better represented than in the film 1984, where basically I am a fascist dictator, and I need to torture you into submission to change your thoughts. How do I frame it? I don't frame it as I'm a fascist dictator and I'm torturing you into changing your thoughts. I frame it as, I frame it as I'm your teacher, and I say to you, brother, you're you're confused. These evil communists, these evil uh, um, religious thoughts have entered your mind. Don't you know they're poison? Don't you know that's a crime? Let me help you. It's a disease of the mind and we can burn it out of you, but that requires pain. I don't want to do this to you, but you're, you're making me do this to you. Why do you make me do this to you? That's what abusers say. That's what abusers say. Why do you make me do this to you? And they're as framed as a favour. I'm helping you, I'm educating you, I'm trying to make you a better person. I'm setting your mind free, brother. Your, your mind is imprisoned by these evil ideals and these evil notions. Let me free you. So then you're being brainwashed, you're being indoctrinated. Now in the 1984 scenario, the beautiful and extremely evil double bind that was played out between the political prisoner and the torturer, but that's also played out by narcissistic parents with their children goes as follows, and I'll post a clip below so you can check this out. Uh, the main character Winston is on a rack, is on a rack, he's not in Iraq, he's on a rack, and uh, um, the guy who's torturing him, uh, played in the more modern version by, by Richard Burton, says, how many fingers am I holding up? And he says, uh, four, so he says, torture him, so he gives him some pain, ah, stop, 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 let's try again, how many fingers am I holding up? One, two, three, four. Torture him. Ah, 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 tortured him again. He says, stop, stop, stop. How many fingers am I holding up? I, I don't know. You tell me. Good. So what the narcissist end goal, what the agenda is, is to actually own your perception of reality, to destroy it, to burn it to the ground and rebuild it in their own image. Yes, the number of fingers I am holding up is the number I tell you. So I need total blind submission. This is at the worst end of the narcissistic scale. This is the most sadistic, cruel end of the narcissistic scale, which requires total blind submission. And where any uh, challenge of that authority raises its head, it will garner a very aggressive response. That was George Orwell's vision of a, of a, of a future government represented in 1984. But you see that in the home. If you were the victim of a narcissistic parent, especially if he or she used violence to back it up, how was your challenge to any authority met when you were a child? Well, in, in my household, it was met with psychotic levels of rage, uh, which, which to a, a young child was terrifying because parents are, are gods. So then what happens to me as an adult? Well, as an adult, I develop a very twitchy and weird attitude to challenging people's authority. But because I'm trauma bonded to challenging authority, I then weirdly become addicted to it and I become one of those needless rebels who, who challenges authority even when the authority is either totally fucking neutral or actually uh, uh, serves me. And that's an instinct in me that, that has to be challenged now because I, the, the, the core belief at the unconscious level in the child's mind is all authority is evil and, and, and must be challenged. Um, so what happens to a lot of people who are raised in these kinds of environments, if you're interested in this, you should go and watch the video I did on Gregory Bateson's double bind theory of schizophrenia. Gregory Bateson, interestingly enough, not a psychiatrist, an anthropologist, just used to observing humans in tribal systems. And he was like, ah, this is how people go crazy. The family unit drives them crazy. Those who've suffered, who become schizophrenics, because they're in a double bind catch-22 within the family unit, they're the black sheep. And usually they'll be the most sensitive, the most empathic uh, person in that environment, and they tend to be the ones who are picked on. So the final, really is the final thought I wanted to leave you with, is this idea of uh, being, being very, very careful about showing weakness in front of people who you think might be narcissists. Uh, there, is a, there is a great line that I'm going to ruin from one of the Silence of the Lambs 
box, one of the trilogy, uh, where uh, Clarice Starling is describing to Hannibal Lecter, who becomes the de facto father figure in her life because her father died young on the job, then the FBI becomes her father, then she is used politically by the FBI and, and pretty much cast aside. So she feels let, she feels abandoned by the first father figure, uh, betrayed by the second father figure, and then adopts this psychopathic serial killer as the next father figure. And um, what Hannibal Lecter says to her is, uh, when the rabbit falls into the trap and screams, the fox comes running, but not to help Clarice, not to help. I think that's really fucking creepy, but it's actually true. If you're a narcissistic abuser, and you need people to lick your jack boots because you're a nutcase and you need that to feel good, uh, you, will, you will attract, you will go for weakness. You, the shark goes for the blood in the water. So if you're consistently attracting narcissists, contemplate how you show weakness, contemplate how you let your guard down. It's a sad thing to have to tell people as a generic piece of psychological coaching for life that you might need to raise your guard a little bit higher. You can't trust that everybody who comes into your environment. There's some very disturbed individuals out there. And bear in mind that in the, uh, in the Hannibal Lecter, which is just a fictional story, but you know, um, I do think um, the guy who wrote it, whose name escapes me right now, uh, had a very good grasp of psychology. He was deeply traumatized as, as a child. And the reason why he was obsessed with eating people was because he was force fed, uh, unknowingly, his own sister. Um, and this is how the mind works. This is, this is a, an accurate reflection of how the psychology of, of, of the pathology of evil and, and narcissism at the most sadistic ends of the scale actually works. There is no mercy. There is no compassion. Expect none. The only thing that you can do that I've heard of, and I've discussed this with a lot of people over the years that seems to work, is withdraw. When you withdraw, you regain your sanity. These people are trying to constantly wear away your view of reality and how you feel. And you can see, um, one final tactic, one final tactic of narcissists is the provocative statement. Oh, uh, I thought you were strong and uh, I see that you're weak. Nobody's, no narcissist who's worth their salt is actually gonna say, I thought you were strong, but I see that you were weak. Um, that would be a very odd thing to say. It's like a line from the Game of Thrones or something. You know, I thought you were strong, but I see you were weak. They'll imply it. Oh, I thought uh, I thought you were a psychologically robust person. Oh, I see, maybe I was wrong. I see. I see. Maybe I was wrong. Did you hear me? So it's like it's a it's it's a hook. It's a bait. I'm I'm baiting you and saying I am strong. And how easy to manipulate are you then? Oh, I, I actually. I really thought you were uh, an ambitious person, uh, but, but, I, but I, I guess I was wrong. You know, that, that structure is almost like a real life trolling. You're trolling that person and you're goading them into, into giving you an emotional response. This is a common tactic of narcissists. They use a hook. They need to hook you in. If you refuse to be hooked and you just identify it for what it is, you can smile, you can shrug, and you can say, okay, that's your reality, those are your needs, that's your addiction. Uh, this is what you do to try and garner attention from people. It's very childish because it's negative attention, but some people do get addicted to negative attention, and they are, as far as I've seen so far, these narcissistic personalities are the victims of, of abuse, and that's why they do and say weird things. Um, so that's the final tactic I'll leave you with. I do think we need to talk uh, another time about different tactics so you know what you're dealing with. It's like preparing people for psychological warfare, this. Um, but it, it, the, the power of this and the healthiness of this and the sanity of this and the relief of this is to say, A, many other people have experienced this and B, it's not you. You're not going crazy. These people are deliberately seeking to press your buttons to provoke you to feel so their ego can be ooh, be fed in this really dark, demonic, uh, weak. It's very weak, it's a very parasitical way. They feed off it. One of the other things we need to talk about is Eckhart Tolle's concept of the pain body, uh, an often misunderstood concept. And I do think that once this pain body rises up in them, it then seeks to draw energy from your pain body. But in order to draw energy from your pain body, I can't have you in a good, healthy, happy state, can I? I need to press your buttons so you've 
ah, so you're angry or pissed off or sad or depressed or suicidal or jealous or whatever so that I can feed off that. And uh, when you're dealing with people who, especially in sexual relationships, who work hard to make you jealous frequently, that's what's happening. They're feeding off your pain so that they feel less pain. It's dark stuff, we're in the dark realms here. And you know, I try and keep these videos light and upbeat because I don't want to depress people or frighten them. I want you to walk away feeling happy and cheerful and you will. Um, but th th these are the darker realms. We're talking about how uh, not all narcissists are, are serial killers, but these are the ways in which uh, career criminals and serial killers and rapists and paedophiles, this is how their minds operate because they don't see people as people, they see people as things. So never expect compassion um, and be careful, keep, keep your guard up. This is like proper self-defense for the mind right now. Okay guys, um, don't get freaked out, live in the light, go and watch some uh, uh, kitten videos. Uh, I saw a really good one the other day. It's called something like Tickling My Scottish Fold Kitten. And this woman for a minute is just tickling this tiny kitten's belly. It's amazing. Anyway, uh, that's enough of that. And I'll speak to you soon. Thank you for your time and your attention.